Hey, there he is. How you doing? <laughs> hey, Chad. Good uh, to see you. It, it's good to see you. It's my turn. I get to I get to introduce the Dr. David Morgan. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> the one and only. One I'm, I'm doing really well. Actually, I'm not the one and only because there's a uh, there actually is another David T. Morgan PhD. He's on Facebook and he has contacted me. He's like an old professor, and he said he said by the way I, I'm on Facebook as well. But uh, and and I think he commented somewhere. He said um, I think he says he's the original, which he probably is, and but that's fine. He doesn't have a BYU shirt. <laughs> So, and he's I'm, not a I'm, I'm, yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm on your side. I'm on your side. So <laughs> we're good. Yeah. Hey, welcome everybody. We're so glad you joined us. My name is Chad Hymas, and as mentioned earlier, Dr. David T. Morgan has joined us, and you can just call him David because that's what he likes to be called. He's that's uh, right. Just very easygoing, and uh, we are we we love doing these uh, on the second and fourth Sunday of every month, where we um, dive deep into the prior conference talks, and uh, very excited for tonight. Tonight's going to be a little bit different because we're not going to talk about what everybody saw at conference. We're going to talk about one of the special talks that was given to all the sisters, um, even though right. it was broadcast. And so I'm excited to share some insight that my wife gave me about this talk. And uh, Dr. Morgan, David's going to tell us a little bit about the speaker that we're going to be I'm talking about to bring him. That's right. Well, actually, Sister and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you first, um, I do prefer to be called David, but um, when... I'll tell you a story. I think it was with our daughter. So our last child um, and my wife had, she wasn't in labor yet, but she was, um, she was scheduled to go in that day to the hospital to be induced. Okay. So we called the hospital that morning and we said, um, you know, it was Kristen Morgan. She's scheduled to come in. They said, Oh, I'm sorry. We don't have any beds. And, and we were frustrated because you know she was ready. She was ready to have this baby. And so um, with that fine. So then I called back. And I said, hi, this is Dr. Morgan. My wife is scheduled to be induced, uh, scheduled to be uh, admitted today. Do you have any beds? Oh, Dr. Morgan. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, we can definitely get you in. And so they totally got us in. And we went down there and, <laughs> Abuser and I was in line. I was a doctor. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. And so I... Uh, they got, we got down there and we got all checked in. And, and once they had broken her water, I knew we weren't going anywhere. And I so they said, oh, well, uh, we didn't see your name on staff here. I said, oh, no, I'm not on staff here. I'm a psychologist. And they kind of went, oh, well, <laughs> but I Hello, thought, this come is, on. This, this is Elder Hymas. Can I talk to President Nelson, please? <laughs> That's right. Probably wouldn't get through. Probably, probably, yeah, probably not. Probably or or he probably get to be in although, the 70s. And then although, really yeah, I, I, do, <laughs> I do think that President Nelson is very, very um, open to people. They just did a fireside recently yeah. in yeah. Salt Lake where there was more outside the conference center than inside. Yeah. My son yeah. got lucky and got inside in the well, very, did he very get in? Oh. He did. But, but they took a picture from the top of the roof and there were thousands of people, thousands upon thousands. It made, wow. and it made me think of the Sermon on the Mount, you know, that just people just listening because they have the speakers outside. And I mean, people yeah. came and just sat on blankets by the thousands. And listen to this conference by President Nelson and his beautiful wife Wendy, yeah. uh, where they taught the young adults of the church, and that was you know an incredible experience. So our, our, why, why, while while our prophet might not answer Elder Hymas's call by title, <laughs> he sure is personable and one of the, probably one of the you know, he's definitely called for our day. The, the, the youth love him. They absolutely no love question him. about it. Well, and he's not going to answer Dr. Morgan's call. I can tell you that. And oh well, no, because you're just Dr. Morgan, yeah. And then one of the things I loved about it is that, and, and we've been seeing this as a pattern more and more with uh, the brethren speaking, is that they have their wives speak as well. Yeah. And Sister Nelson, she's actually a licensed psychologist. She has a PhD as well. Um, and she, but I think her focus was in uh, marriage and family therapy. And so for years, she, re she did research and teaching, and she's a very, very um, uh, accomplished woman. And so I love that we're getting kind of uh, equal time here uh, to hear from the great women of the church as well. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight with Sister Bingham uh, yeah. and these, um, this women's session, which had uh, mostly speakers from the, the sister leadership of the church. But let me tell you about a little bit about Sister Jean B. Bingham. Um, she's the she president has, of the church. Kind of she, she's the president. Yeah, she's the she's the president. Yep. Sister Jean Barris Bingham is the 17th general president of the Relief Society, 
which is one of the largest women's organization, largest, one of the world's largest women's organizations. At the time of her call in April 2017, she was serving as first counselor in the primary general presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. She also served on the general board of the primary, which is the church's organization for 1 million children who are ages 11 and younger. Uh, the Provo, Utah native is the third of Robert R. and Edith Joy Clark Barris's nine children. Her childhood and youth were spent in Texas, Minnesota, and New Jersey. Sister Bingham met her husband, Bruce, while they were both students at Brigham Young University. They were married in the Provo, Utah Temple, December 22nd, 1972, and are the parents of two daughters and have five grandchildren. She and her husband were also foster parents to teens and children, many of whom who have become part of their family. That's something you guys have in common, Chad. That's, that's awesome. I didn't know that. Um, I, didn't know, I didn't know that about her. While her children were in their later school years, Sister Bingham returned to college. She received a bachelor's degree and master's degree in teaching from National Lewis University in Illinois. She also received associate degrees from BYU and Elgin Community College. She taught English as a second language to elementary students at a private school, in addition to immigrants and others for nonprofit organizations. She also worked as a nurse's aide. Sister Bingham worked as a volunteer aide in her children's schools and served in numerous teaching and leadership positions with the women, children, and youth in her local congregation, serving as president of the primary and young women and as counselor in the Relief Society. She taught teenagers in early morning seminary for six years. That's something she and I have in common. Um, although I didn't teach for six years, I was five and a half, four and a half. And okay. she's served as a temple ordinance worker in the Chicago, Illinois temple. We have that in common as well. I was an ordinance worker in the Portland temple. She credits the faithful examples of her parents for her testimony as the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, in addition to personal church attendance and service. Participating in family history work and attending the temple have strengthened her commitment to becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. And as far as personal uh, enjoyments, she enjoys reading, outdoor recreation, such as hiking, camping, and canoeing, traveling, cooking for her appreciative family, and spending any time available with grandchildren. And that's something that she and I, that we all have in common is spending a time with our grandchildren. We love that. Chad recently became a grandpa, probably what, three months ago, maybe? Four. Uh, four. four months ago. We just celebrated four months, yeah. And that's, and I have four grandchildren. The oldest will be five in, uh, five years old in September. And awesome. yeah, spending time with grandchildren, that's just, that's I got in bear. trouble though the other day. I gave, <laughs> I gave, gave the four month old some ice cream with some, chocolate oh. she threw no. up well I, I bet she did <laughs> she not because she didn't like it it's just her stomach wasn't used to oh, it. she loved it oh, she that's right made her it made her stop crying she loved it and then she just threw up <laughs> i'm just trying to get her used to it's right. like having a taco for the first time with hot sauce you're not gonna your body's not gonna take it so i'm just trying to i'm just trying to help her adapt it but her parents didn't see it like that so now i don't get to babysit by myself yeah, I, was, I was gonna say yeah that's probably uh uh, doctor, don't don't take yeah. your prescription from Doctor Chad Hymas. Yeah, he's gonna no. give you. I still think it was a brilliant <laughs> idea. I do want to say something <laughs> about this talk. I um, my <laughs> wife was there. My wife is the Stake Relief Society president where we live, and she did uh, she go to the she did. She, oh, she very brought nice. Brought home some information. She told me this. She said it was the first meeting that it w where uh, in the General Relief Society where one of the members of the first presidency did not conduct um oh, she conducted right. so sister bingham conducted the meeting um it's not because there was an, a change in the church it's not because there was some big announcement or the lady or the sisters received some sort of uh, uh priesthood or anything like that it's right it's 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 there's no reason why they should not be able to conduct They've that's exactly been. right so Women i thought that my wife thought that time. was really she caught that and it wasn't announced she said it wasn't it wasn't some big there was not some big announcement or anything like that it's just shondell noticed that hey president nelson didn't get up or elder oaks did not get up or you right. know uh, or president oaks didn't get up it, she got up and she conducted the meeting and that was the first time that that's ever happened i appreciate that she mentioned that because i i noticed that but had it but it hadn't uh, clicked with me yeah that, that was the first time in a in a general in a general conference meeting that a sister had conducted and it was, I tell you, it was the, I amongst the whisperings of the whole group amongst the you know 17 20,000 people in the conference center the whisperings exactly. were happening 
Man, well, and there's and there's been a number of policy changes as well. Yeah. Um, if you've been to uh, the temple in the last year or so, you'll notice that there's sisters at the recommend desk That's who are right. checking recommends now. There's no um, reason why they can't be. There's no reason. I, I think we got we get stuck in a lot of tradition. Yeah. And I think President Nelson is just took a he said, I want you to give me a list of everything we're doing in the church. And I want you to put a check mark by the things that we can't change because of doctrine. And I want to talk about everything else. And, and, I would just, and so they yeah. probably sat down and said, well, why can't Sister Bingham conduct this meeting? They said, of course she can. And so I love that um, we're just seeing more equal play. And, and actually, we'll get into that a little bit here as we talk about the difference. We talk about priesthood power um, and priesthood authority. There's a lot of, of doctrine and truth that's been clarified in the last few years about that. Sister uh, Barbara um, Garner uh, or Gardner has written some books about this. She is amazing and has a very, very good understanding of this. But um, Sister Bingham goes on to talk about the covenants that we've made. Covenant is a promise with God. It's a two-way promise. We promise things to him. He promises things to us. He sets the terms of the agreement. We don't negotiate covenants. We don't say, well, I'll, I'll do this for that. It's not how it works with God. He says, you do these things, and then I will give you these other things, and you can say yes or no. And, that, and that's how it works with covenants. Right. Um, and, that, and the first covenant we make is baptism. The first yeah. covenant we can possibly make is to be baptized. No, I, I again, I, I I love how she goes into this, and then she starts right. Or the title of her talks is simply this: that the covenants of God strengthen, protect, and prepare us for eternal glory. And I love the the whole reason behind this talk is because today promises seem to be taken for granted. Um, mm -hmm. Covenants seem to be taken. We seem to be losing our values, and 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 we seem to be letting go of what we have been taught all along. That you know, the, the in the Bible. And in the Book of Mormon, people are cyclical and nothing could be further from, you know, that same thing. And nothing could be more close to that than today. We're, 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 we seem to be on that. I don't know that we're on an upswing, but much of the world is on that downward slope of, hey, right. we can sway away a little here. We can get away with this a little bit more here. You know, we can we can call out, uh, you know, people who have their different skin color, the different faiths or the different beliefs here and. And nothing can be further from the truth there. We need to hold true to what we've been taught, that God counts all of his sheep. He loves yeah. every one of his sheep. And covenants with God will bring us closer to them. They'll strengthen us. They'll protect us. And that's where she's going with this talk. That's right. She, yeah. And that. So well, you talked about like, baptism. So she, I didn't mean to throw you out, but she talked about the first covenant of baptism. And she and she goes on and, and she talks about what that means. That we promise to obey God's commandments when we're baptized, live yeah. the gospel of Jesus Christ, be morally pure, dedicate our time and talents to the Lord. Now she's talking about temple covenants. And then yep. in return, God promises blessings in this life and the opportunity to return to him. In that process, we are given or endowed with the power to discern between truth and error, between right and wrong amidst confusing yep. and negative voices that bombard us. What a powerful gift. That's what she talks about right there. So there's a blessing. There's a, there's a, there's a gift. There's a Christmas present right there. If That's we will right. simply do that right there, what, what a wonderful gift. But we can choose. Well, we'll, we'll know what's right and wrong, and some people just that's right. they, they can't seem to discern the difference. So, uh, oh, and it's becoming much, much more difficult to discern the difference between right and wrong, um, sure. just because everything is. Um, I, I mean, with with hardly any training, you could create a website, a very basic website. Um, mm -hmm. There's tools that make that very easy, and then you could put a blog on there that could sound very official title your website, something very official. You could call it journal of scientific knowledge or something like that. Right. And just completely made it up. And then you could put stuff on there. That's completely false. But if you present it the right way, it could it look very attractive. attractive. And someone might say, Oh, well, that's gotta be true because look, it's on the internet and it's got a very scientific name and stuff like that. And, and it can be very challenging to tell the difference between truth and error anymore. And we need the Holy Ghost, we need the Spirit to be able to tell us this is right and this is wrong. And that's what, in that first covenant of baptism, we make the promise to keep the commandments, to follow Jesus Christ. And we partake of the sacrament every week. We remember and renew that covenant where we promise to take his name upon us and to always remember him and to keep his commandments. And then the, the exchange is when we get baptized, we get the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
And we, when we partake of the sacrament is that, that the, his spirit will always be with us so that that gift that we're never separated from that gift and that we have Same. the constant influence of the Holy Ghost in our lives. That's the, the gift. The temple is the same way. You go to the temple when you are endowed, you make covenants, you make agreements to do certain things and to not do certain things. And as a result of that, you are endowed with spiritual power, which enables you to withstand temptation and to tell the difference between right and wrong. So it's that same old thing again, that covenant. You do something, the Lord does something in return. And every time the things that we have to give him are nothing compared to the things that we get in return. It's like we're giving him $10 worth of work and he's giving us a million dollars worth of benefit every single time. The Lord is so generous when it comes to those. Tells you how far off the beaten path I am because it says that the promise is you'll be able to discern right from wrong. And I swear the right thing was to give the baby ice cream. And, <laughs> and one of us is not right. And I'm sure, pretty sure that I'm the one that's right. And so I, 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 I need to talk to Shondell about staying on the covenant path. I'll talk that's about right. that. <laughs> we'll have her pull out Dr. Spock's book and you can read there that. You and, uh, you know. There you go. Next time we give the baby Fruit Loops. Watch where I am. I won't be, right. I won't be doing this I'll, I'll be locked up in the garage somewhere. So no, but she goes on and, and, and I love this. She talks about life's experiences. She, she goes into this analogy and mm -hmm. I love where she, and Shondell thought that this was, she said you had to be present to, 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 to actually feel what was going on in the room when she talked about this, but she talks about life's experiences can range from humorous and heart wrenching from grim to glorious from each, from each experience helps us to understand more about our father's encompassing love and our capacity to change through the savior's gift of grace. Keeping our covenants allows the savior's power to cleanse us as we learn through experiences. And I want to add my little lingo in there. It, yeah especially through our challenging or our mistakes or our painful. It's okay to make mistakes. God does not expect us to be perfect. So I, when I was reading this talk in preparation for tonight, that's the way that I read it is that even though I've made covenants with God and I promise to do things, I I'm probably going to mess up. Yeah. Um, and, and his grace is sufficient for that. As long as I'm willing to ask for forgiveness and do the best I can to try and get back on that covenant path and not, give the ice cream out until the baby's ready, you know, or, or <laughs> I, I say that in, you know, facetiously, but, but, but there's some truth sure. to that in, in that, right. you know, I got to do my best to try and make a better decision in the future. So, well, and, and it, sometimes we stray from the covenant path because of things we haven't learned yet or things right. we haven't learned right. completely. And right. that's something that you learned. You learned that a baby's stomach is not, cannot digest the, the materials that come from cow's milk until it's about a year old. Um, and so, and, and once your granddaughter's a year old, man, you won't be able to keep her away from the ice cream and she'll be able to handle it wow. just fine. But right now she can't, she's just too little from it. And that's why, you know, breast milk and baby formula uses a different, um, you know, formulation than, than cow's milk does. I but now you've yes. learned that. And I so am. now that you've learned it, the question is, do you change your behavior because of it? And if you no. give ice cream to the baby a month from now, no, that's, you know, then you're going to be like, oh, come on, Chad, you you knew my, about this. You knew this. My desire to have to be her favorite outweighs my <laughs> desire to be righteous. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> well, Boy, then, I think this will be my last episode tonight. I think Shannon yeah. Man, you're going to kick me off. Yeah, exactly. The, We've so. really loved having Chad don't with listen us. To my, yeah, don't yeah, don't, don't listen to my analogies, folks. This, we're, <laughs> don't do that at all. So what a, what a powerful gift though. I, I, and you're absolutely right. And I, uh, I, I think that, that we can relate this to many things. I, she, uh, there's a verse, I'm trying to find it, David. I can't, I was going to ask you about it. Oh, talk about this. So she talks about, um, this experience that she personally had about That's repelling right. the edge. You got to share that. Yeah, for sure. So she, so I've never been repelling. Um, but, but I know what it is and it's where you go, basically go, yeah, you go backwards off of a cliff and you're secured by ropes and one of the ropes is attached up top. And then, the, and then there's a person down below who call, called the belayer. And that person is like a counterweight to your body weight and helps you descend right. slowly, um, down the mount or down the, the sheer face of whatever it is. So she says, um, and, and you have to step backward off, off the cliff, which requires a lot of faith. So this is what she does. She says, um, I, she says, I vividly remember go repelling with a group of young women. I was first in the group to go. As I stepped backwards off the cliff, I began to fall without control. 
Gratefully, the rope jerked and my too rapid descent was stopped. As I dangled halfway down the jagged rock face, I prayed fervently for whomever or whatever was keeping me from dropping onto the rocks. Later, I learned that the anchor bolt had not been securely set, and as I stepped off the edge, the person belaying me was jerked on his back and was pulled towards the edge of the cliff. Somehow, he wedged his feet against some rocks. Stabilized in that position, he was able to laboriously lower me hand over hand with the rope. Although I couldn't see him, I knew he was working with all his strength to save me. Another friend was at the bottom of the cliff, prepared to catch me if the rope ceased to hold. As I came within reach, he caught my harness and lowered me to the ground. So, so great she gives analogy. The, great it's analogy. a great analogy. So she was prepared. She had the rope ready, and but it was not attached correctly. So she jumps off the cliff and just starts falling. Fortunately, the person below was able to, you know, secure himself and stop her from falling. But I love that analogy of sometimes even despite our best intentions, yeah. something can go wrong. And that's why we have the Savior there. The Savior has always got his hand on that rope and he is going to help us. And he and like she said, that that man was laboriously or strenuously lowering her down, using all of his energy to keep her from falling and getting dashed on the rocks. That's what the Savior does all the time. He, he protects us from those hard falls. Even when we do something stupid, he says, look, I'm here to, to soften that blow. Um, the, the last thing we want is to pay the price for our sins, the full price of our sins. When we repent, we have to pay a price. There's always a price to be paid, but it is a fraction of the actual cost. The Savior has paid for everything, and so he decides what you pay in return. He says, he says this is the actual sin price of stealing whatever it is, $10,000, he says, I'm going to ask you to pay me 500. And so, and that's the way he works. I don't think he ever asks us to pay that full price. He's too merciful. And when we come to him and ask for that, for that help, he always helps us. So yeah, I love that analogy. You're trying to do what's right and still something goes wrong, but the savior is there to, to help. She makes a distinction too, that the anchor is not necessarily God or Jesus Christ, but the anchor is actually our faith. Yeah. And I think that's powerful. She says that faith in God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the anchor we must have in our lives to hold fast during these challenging times of social turbulence and wickedness. Our faith must be centered in Christ, his life and his atonement and the restoration of his gospel. So just because we all know that Christ is the redeemer, um, the only begotten and the father doesn't mean that we are anchored correctly. We have to. We have to do something. We have to show works. We've always, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has always taught that faith without works is dead. We have to exercise our faith. We have to work. And she distinguishes that here, that Christ alone is not the, is not the anchor. And, and you know what's ironic about that is many Christian faiths believe the exact opposite. Hey, I was sure. baptized. I'm saved. I was saved when I was 12. I was saved when I was 16. I was saved. Now, I'm not mocking. I'm just saying that. That's a distinguishment between our faith, the Latter-day Saint faith, and many others, is that we believe that, that, that you must have work. You must be a work in progress. You must work towards that, that, that you're not saved just because you happen to believe in his word. You must have faith and continue to try and make progress and repent on a regular basis and, and seek for his atoning sacrifice. And that, it, that takes brothers and sisters, fellow friends that are watching that aren't members of that takes work. That yeah. takes effort. Um, just because I was baptized does not mean that I'm going to be saved by the grace of God um, in his highest glory. How's that? I will be saved to some degree, but if I want to be with him and if I want to live in his same house and, you know, be a regular guest at the table, whatever that looks like, or work on his farm, whatever that, that would be <laughs> ideal for me. <laughs> I am going to have to work my tail off at yeah. not learning how to dig a hole or plant seeds or crops in the normal sense of the word, but I'm going to have to learn how to plant seeds of faith and learn how to be a better minister and learn how to yeah. save his garden, his sheep and his flocks, not necessarily mine. And, uh, and that will come into, into play down the road. Well, and one of the doctrines that is unique to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is that we're not only just trying to live with God again, we're trying to become like him, that That's we will true. do what he does someday, that there will be a 
Chad and Shondell universe somewhere where the two of you have become exalted and you are a heavenly father and heavenly mother and you have spirit children and you send them down to earths that you create and that you manage and i mean talk about your farming dream you'll be able to create worlds you know and do all kinds of things make waterfalls and beautiful mountains and those sorts of things and you will do that to help your children become like you your spiritual children that's so the goal. that's that, the that is the goal. goal and that's his that's his goal Oh, that's, that's exactly what he wants for us. He's, 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 that's, we need to point that out. That's just not our goal, but he wants no. to give us everything he has. Kind of like me with my kids. I'd like to, I'd like to give my kids, but I can't give my kids if they make choices that, that imprison themselves. Sure. Or that right. And so, but he did send down his son that would help us if we'd believe on him to be able to come back. But believing is not enough. We have to demonstrate through faith that that we are worthy of that, those gifts that he has to offer. But right. he, wants, he wants us to have all that he has. Um, well, and, today, and believing, right, believing like, gets us a, a, a certain way. It's, it's almost like um, if you were to use the example of a gym, believing gets you in the gym. <clears throat> and if you're, you can say you're saved, I got in the gym. That's great. I'm a member. I, I qualified to be a member of the gym. But now what? Right. And I, I could be a member of that gym and never go or go to the gym and just sit in the hot tub the whole time and not go lift any weights or run on a treadmill or ride a bike or anything like that. My, my physical health is not going to improve just becoming a member of the gym. If I want to become stronger and faster and healthier, then I need to get out there and do the work. And I think that's uh, an apt analogy for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or any form of Christianity. Believing and accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior, absolutely, we have to do that. That gets your membership in the gym. Now what? Now what are you going to do? You know, and as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we have all kinds of opportunities to serve. You can read your scriptures. You can minister to other people. You can go to the temple. You can do all these things. Or you can be passive and you can go to church and not participate or not go to church. You're still a member, you know, and maybe you're not doing anything bad either, but you're not doing anything to grow and progress and this idea of moving along the covenant path, it's not just qualifying to be on the covenant path, it's moving along the covenant path. We need to be very different than we were when we left our Heavenly Father's presence when we get back to him. We need to be changed and be more like him. And that's doing the work. That's putting in that, that physical, spiritual exercise, so to speak. Um, and that, uh, And she talks about strengthening our faith in him, strengthening that anchor. Just like, well, how would you strengthen your muscles? You would do exercises. How do you strengthen your faith? You do ex faith exercises. You learn, you, you trust, you do things when even when it's not popular or when you have doubts, you still move forward. Uh, when church becomes difficult to go to because you don't like the bishop or because some sister said something to you that you don't like and you still go, that's exercising your faith. That's making it stronger. Um, she, she says, uh, we pray with a humble heart, study and ponder the scriptures, take the sacrament with a spirit of repentance and reverence, strive to keep the commandments and follow the prophet's counsel. And as we fulfill our everyday tasks in higher and holier ways, we become more connected to the Savior and at the same time help others to come unto him. Strengthening that anchor, that faith anchor through the things that we do. I, uh, I wanted to ask you a question. So the title of our talk is Covenants Bring Us Closer to Our Father in Heaven. And by keeping covenants um, and holding fast to those covenants, they'll, they'll bring us closer and bring us happiness and joy. What's the ultimate covenant that the Latter-day Saint faith teaches that no other church can claim to? What's the ultimate covenant? The ultimate covenant that we teach? That what would no be one of the highest covenants that, that, that takes place in the temple? In other words, what well, are the yeah, so the, so, in, so, yeah, there are five covenants that we make all together there's um or, or well there's the baptismal covenant and then you get the gift of the holy ghost uh, men are ordained to priesthood office and they take the oath and covenant of the priesthood you make covenants and endowment but then the crowning ordinance of it all like you're saying is the sealing um being so sealed that really quick. So she hits this she she talks yeah. about this so oh and, yes and right, the, there. The, right so the ceiling is all the ceilings for those that wonder what, what what is a seal what's david talking about the ceiling it's another word for marriage. The only difference is we don't to death do you part. We don't do that. We 
we strive to live worthy, to live with our families and our companion forever. That means that the child that we lost, uh, one of our first children at birth, that we will, we're going to be with that child again. Yeah. Not just see them, but they will be a part, an integral part of our family. Can I just yeah. tell you, I, I, I like this life. It's cool, but I can't wait to see that kid. <laughs> I cannot wait to see that kid to see and learn and be a part of that kid's life. So she yeah. says this. This is a huge motivator, by the way, if you're not a Latter-day Saint. Get in the game quick. I'm just saying this. This is huge. <laughs> There's the sales pitch right here. This yeah. is the, I, I'm, not, I'm just saying this is this is so huge because why would you? I, there is nothing more important to our eternal progression than keeping our covenants with God. When our temple covenants, remember the temples are built to seal, to seal yeah. families together, to seal a husband and a wife together and their families. That is the goal. That child or parent or spouse who has left mortality already is hoping with all of his or her heart that you will be true to the covenants yeah. that bind you all together. If we disregard or treat lightly our covenants with God in the temple, we are putting those eternal ties in danger or at risk. Now is the time to repent. Now is the time to repair. Now is the time to, I'm just going to say, she didn't say this. Now is the time to become a member and to get, get temple worthy and to go make those covenants. No other church can offer that because... No other church is God's church. His church has been set aside. I'm not knocking other faiths. That, that's not what we're here to do. Uh, right. But there is no other church that can make that claim or offering because God's right. church has, has been restored through the prophet Joseph Smith um, 200 years ago in preparation for the second coming. And that is the ultimate crowning ordinance of his gospel. Well, and it's doctrine that is not very clearly taught in the Bible and so um, it, there needed to be a restoration. There needed to be uh, new information coming in, God to reestablish his church, which he did, like you said, through the prophet Joseph Smith. And these, this additional information that was had among saints of, in the past, but that was lost, was, was revealed again to Joseph Smith. And that's how we know that families can be together forever. Okay. That when children, uh, little children, you know, premature babies and things like that that are born without having hardly any or, or maybe die in the womb, that we can be together with them again. That is a very, very comforting doctrine yeah. that is taught in the church. Uh, it's um, or when you lose, you know, you lose somebody unexpectedly, or when you lose somebody expectedly, yeah. somebody, you know, it doesn't matter if they're a young child or not, but just the fact that I'm going to get to hang out with my uncle again that I lost at a young age, or yeah. just pay people that have moved to the other side of the veil before me, friends that I've known. You know, yeah. but, uh, but 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 family, you're still dear family, and that is the crowning. That's the crowning jewel. That is the diamond in the rough. That is the highest cloud there is. That's the highest mountain. When you talk about creating your own mountains, to me, that is the the crescendo of a farm is being with my family uh, and just being in their in their presence. And the problem is, is is I know they're gonna be there. I just I'm hanging by that. I'm hanging by that rope that's off the cliff saying, hey, can you help me get back up to where you guys serve for me? I, uh, my hands don't, they're just clinging. They don't grab very well. Can you guys help me out with this? I made a few mistakes at that other place, that other world we were at. Need some help. I, got, I fed you some ice cream. For, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> well, and we can, the, the power that we need in order to kind of stay on the covenant path, the power actually comes from staying on the covenant path and it's the priesthood power. Um, and there's, I think there's been misunderstanding in the church. I know there's been a misunderstanding in the church for quite some time where people have assumed that priesthood power was, is, is like, um, like laying your hands on someone's head and giving them a blessing. Well, that's part of it. But what the leaders of the church have since clarified is that anyone who has made a covenant has access to priesthood power. And so that's anyone who's a baptized member of the church, male or female, anyone who's an endowed member of the church, male or female, has access to priesthood power. And that is um, that is not insignificant. Very fair. You, you Very can, fair. and that will bless your life. That will give you strength to withstand temptations. And the greater that we keep our covenants, the more faithful we are to our covenants, the more priesthood power we have. Now, you and I have priesthood office. We've both been ordained to offices in the priesthood. But 
our power depends, depends on how well we're keeping our covenants, right? If I decide today to do a bunch of crazy things to violate my covenants, notwithstanding I hold the Melchizedek priesthood, I got zero priesthood power. That's right. I just don't have it. And if my wife, who has never been ordained to priesthood office, if she's keeping her covenants, then she's got way more priesthood power than I do. So it's I, th I think it's a great thing to understand where we've often associated the priest. We've said that the priesthood is the men. The priesthood is not the men. Men are ordained to priesthood office. But it's, an, everyone, it's authority. It's authority. It, exactly. Everyone who makes a covenant has priesthood power. And what you want in this life is priesthood power. You want power against the adversary. You want power against deception. That's what Sister Bingham talks about, that she's saying, right. stay on the covenant path to Jesus Christ, um, preparing as a young woman to receive the protection and strength that temple covenants uh, give to you and the courage that it uh, that it brings as well. I, I love that idea of, of the power that comes from... Um, from doing what's right, basically, all of us have that, have access to that. And we're going to need it because there's tough times. I mean, your granddaughter, holy cow, what, what's she going to be faced with? It's, you know what I'm saying? I know. I mean, she's I know. going to grow up because it's sad. crazy times. It is crazy times. It's crazy times for all of us. And she talks about this. She talks about the storms in life. She says turbulent yeah. waters right here. She says many of us are experiencing rough waters as we are tossed by waves of adversity and are sometimes blinded by the torrents of tears that come in those difficulties, we may not know which direction to paddle our light's boat. We may not even think we have the strength to get to the shore. Remember who you are, a beloved child of God, and why you are on the earth. And your goal of living with God and your loved ones can clear your vision and point you in the right direction. In the midst of the storm, there is a bright light to show you the way. I am the light which shineth in the darkness. Jesus declared, we are assured of safety when we look to his light and maintain the integrity of our covenants. And then she kind of wraps up by saying, we need to stay close to the prophets, seers, and revelators that are ordained that give us direction and guidance through these challenging watered times, through these turbulent times that we're going through in our era, in our day and age. And I would just add this piece here as my closing remarks. It's amazing to me, David, how in tune the brethren are with the turbulences that are happening yeah. They know, I mean, and it's it's not because they're involved in negativity. It's not because they're involved in pornography or because they're involved. They know the challenges of our day and they hit it hard every conference. I would encourage you, my dear friends that are watching, to uh, be excited about the next general conference. Go back and reread these talks uh, that took place on this last conference. Reread every one of them. You can find them um, at lds.org. They're all right there. Just go to conference talks and you will find them. The talk that we're talking about tonight and be looking forward to when we gather together again this fall um, and, and we will receive further instruction for our times. We meet every six months as, as a church. We listen to our prophet uh, speak uh, uh, over a pulpit to all of us and, and the apostles. And I would just admonish you to do that. And that's how I would, I would end my comments regarding this talk. Yeah, I, I appreciate that so much. And I, um, you're absolutely right. I think it's definitely by design that we have those meetings every six months. Um, it gets easy to get off track. Elder Rookdorf has talked about that, that um, when flying a plane, there's these constant course corrections that need to be made. You know, you just you have to constantly be checking. Of course, now it's probably all autopilot. And the, um, That's right. The, Auto, the, uh, sure. the plane does that itself. But back before autopilot, Pilots had to be constantly checking to make sure they were on the right bearings because even just a little bit, you know, two degrees to the left and you could end up hundreds and hundreds of miles off course, uh, you know, if you travel far enough. And staying on the covenant path requires us to have that constant correction every day. Every day we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer and we say, Heavenly Father, thank you for what you've given me. I'd like to have these blessings if you, you know, if you would, and please forgive me for the things I've done that are wrong. And we, and, and we read the scriptures and we adjust our course so that we are continually walking on that covenant path. Yeah. I, I love it. I'm, I love general conference and love the opportunity to hear from the, the sisters and the brothers, such strong testimonies. I just, I fully recommend everything that sister Bingham has taught here. Um, anchoring ourselves in Jesus Christ and using him as um, 
as the, just following him, our faith in Jesus Christ, the first principle of the gospel, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, not just faith, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He becomes our, 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 our focal point. If we stay with him, we're going to be just fine. I agree. I, uh, <laughs> I love diving deep into these talks every, every two weeks. This is, a, this is a lot of fun. It's absolutely a, a pure joy for me, a pure joy. We well, everyone, until uh, we'll look forward to the next time, everyone. Thanks again for watching and to Onward Productions, a labor oh, yeah. of love. Thanks to Shane and Mandy for uh, inviting us to do this. It's a labor of love for us too, and we love it. I love it. Chad loves it. And uh, sure. just a great time. And we're strengthened because of it. We hope that you are strengthened as well. Good night, everybody. Good night.